We'll start with Punk. You all know the basic gist of what happened based on all the emails that I've gotten over the past week asking me about it. Punk showed up at Raw last Monday night, the night after the Rumble. He met with Vince McMahon only about an hour or two before the show, and he told him, that's it, I'm going home. And he left, and he boarded a flight back to Chicago. And has not been heard from since. And so here we are with CM Punk only, you know, what, two months? Is it two months? About two months away from WrestleMania now. Seemingly gone from the company and out of the picture. He still has several months left on his contract. Nobody knows exactly what's going to happen. I've been getting message after message after message about, is this a work? Or telling me flat out, this is a work. Don't be gullible. All of these different things. Punk uh, was at the Wizard World convention in Portland last Friday, a couple days before the Royal Rumble. He did a Q&A. Hindsight being what it is, you know, you watch the, the highlights that are up on YouTube and all the signs were there of his unhappiness. You know, he said this is Daniel Bryan's year. He'd like to see him get the main event spot at WrestleMania, which was interesting given that Punk, you know, Punk's one lone goal, he's talked about this before in wrestling, is to headline a WrestleMania and even he realizes that Brian should have gotten that opportunity this year. And, and maybe he still will. Um, but you watch the, the, the video, and Punk just seems overall disinterested in wrestling right now. You know, he said he shows up, they tell him what to do, he does it, and he leaves. Hardly the, uh, the rebel character that he was portraying back in 2011. It's almost like the system has beaten him down. Uh, he talked about not really taking a break over the last 10 years. His body's beaten up. You know, the dude's burned out. And it has nothing to do with Batista winning the Royal Rumble. He's very friendly with Dave. And and he even said in the Q&A, it's different from The Rock. And at least that, you know, Batista signed a long-term contract. He is back full-time for for two years, supposedly. And, you know, I get where Punk is coming from. But I heard that, and I rolled my eyes. I know I talked about this on the sound off at the time when reports were leaking out from people in the company and other wrestlers about how unhappy the wrestlers were, that The Rock was coming back to take a spot away from them, not realizing, of course, that Rock was going to do monster business for them, which he did, and that they would all benefit from that. So I don't know why Punk is still crying about that. Those two WrestleManias with Rock in the main event did bigger business than any other WrestleMania shows ever. And there's nobody they could bring back and put in that spot Short of Steve Austin in the main event, maybe, who could do the kind of business for them. You know, and even Austin, he's not nearly as big of a star as Rock is now. He's been out of the spotlight for over a decade. So Rock was the one guy, if you could bring him back to work your biggest show of the year, you're a fool not to jump all over that. I don't think Batista's going to mean nearly as much in that spot. But to kill that rumor, it it wasn't Batista. He's not the reason for Punk's uh, discontent been reported that one of the main points of frustration for Punk right now was being programmed with Triple H at WrestleMania. That was the rumored match. That was one of the the top two, probably, top two or three matches scheduled for WrestleMania this year. And I guess, you know, Punk's not buying what they're selling. He doesn't see that as being the kind of match that he wants to be in at WrestleMania. And I'm sure that won't make Triple H very fond of Punk, which can make things interesting when and if he ever comes back. And I'm almost sure he'll be back. You know, whether it takes six months or a year, two years, whatever. I mean, you can never say for sure, because look at Jeff Hardy. He was the number two babyface in the company at one point. Big, big star, making a ton of money. And he left on his own. Now, granted, he had the drug bust after that. But it's going to be five years, if you can believe it. And he's still with TNA. Jeff Hardy's a, a free spirit. Does what he wants. So is Punk. It's not so much about the money with Punk, because walking out right before your biggest payoff of the year at WrestleMania is a pretty strong case, I think, made there that there are more important things to the guy than money. He doesn't seem to live a a lavish lifestyle. I saw that interview he did from his kitchen with Ariel Helwani. He's got himself a nice apartment, but it's not like he lives in a fortress like John Cena does. And, you know, there's other rumors out there that in terms of the money, he was upset because he didn't feel he was properly compensated for certain events in the past and one other point he brought up in that Ariel Helwani interview and this is not just you know dirt sheet rumor BS he he said this flat out on camera is that he doesn't know how this new network which is now launching in less than a month is going to affect Wrestlemania payoffs 
and payoffs for future pay-per-views because a lot of the wrestlers, especially the ones like you know Punk in his position, even though he's been demoted of late from where he had been, let's say, a year ago when he still had that, that title run going, and he was headlining the Rumble against The Rock, and he headlined uh, Elimination Chamber against The Rock. He had the match with The Undertaker or Mania. <clears throat> so he, he was involved in some pretty high-profile pay-per-view matches. I'm sure his pay-per-view payoffs were, were quite nice, uh, probably a lot more than somebody like a Kofi Kingston would get. But nobody knows how the launch of the network is going to affect payoffs at Mania and, and elsewhere for the for the wrestlers. Punk is among them, and, I, and apparently that was a point of contention with him, to the point where he actually brought it up in that interview with Ariel Helwani when he asked him, oh, what do you think about the new network? You know, as a wrestling fan, this has got to be like a dream. And Punk said, yeah, I wish something like this was around in 1997. But... And then he, you know, he went into the whole payoff issue. So that's part of it. Uh, you know, and then there's other rumors that he was unhappy, realizing he was never going to be the top, top guy. As long as John Cena's in that spot, it's always going to be Cena. Brian, of course, has had this groundswell of support in recent months. Uh, and, and one of the reasons Punk wanted to turn heel when he did last year was so that he can be the number one guy, at least on the heel side. You know, and I think, I, you know, think back to when Edge was the number one guy on SmackDown. Many, many years ago, Edge carried that brand. That was a position that Edge embraced. You know, Edge didn't want to be on Raw and get lost in the shuffle and play second and third fiddle to John Cena and Triple H. At least then, he was able to get away from those guys. He was able to get more television time and be the top guy on a brand. And there is no brand split anymore. There has not been a brand split for many years. You have one WWE, the storylines overlap now on Raw and SmackDown, and he realizes that he's just not going to be that that top guy. So it's a combination of all of these different things that have led us to the point that we are at right now. And my view is this. If the guy is burned out, I get it. You know, it's a hard lifestyle. What makes this different than Steve Austin walking out on the company in 2002? Because I got a ton of emails asking me if the two situations are identical. How do they compare? You know, they compare a little bit, but, you know, it's a yes and no. There's no straight answer to that question. Are they identical situations? No, but they have a lot of similarities. Austin was not happy with the plans they had for him creatively. They were going to give away the first match between Steve Austin and Brock Lesnar for free on Raw as a King of the Ring qualifier with Brock going over. And Austin looked at that and said, fuck that. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. I don't have a problem losing to Brock, but now's not the time to do it. You build up a match like that for pay-per-view. And he's right. But he was still wrong to walk out the way that he did. And today, Austin acknowledges that. He says it was the biggest regret that he has, walking out on the company back then the way he did. There's a right way and a wrong way to handle things, and he handled it the wrong way. He admits that. Because when you do something like that, you know, even if you feel you're right for doing it, it affects everybody else in the company. It's a selfish thing to do. With Punk, this is this has been building for a while now. Okay, this was not one day I don't like the creative plans for TV tonight, or you know, one day, oh, I, I think I'll go home today. The signs have been there for a while. Sounds like there was a, a really good chance he wasn't gonna re sign when his contract expires in July. But the thing is, he's got, what, five five or six months left on his deal? You signed the contract. A very lucrative contract, I'm sure. Honor your deal. Don't walk away and leave everybody else in a lurch. And I'm not even talking about, oh, he let the fans down. You know, the only fans that Punk let down are the fans who paid money to see him at the live events coming up in the upcoming weeks and for the people who paid to see him at the Access signings WrestleMania weekend, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. In terms of letting down the fans, those are the only fans that he actually let down. All these other fans, the big CM Punk, oh, he let the fans down. What do you, He let the fans down? Did you specifically pay money for a ticket to see him in the next month or two? Because if not, I don't see how this affects you. This affects the people who work in WWE. Especially heading into WrestleMania. They have plans in place. This guy's going to wrestle that guy. All of a sudden, one of your top stars walks out, and now everything has to be reshuffled. And, and maybe that's a good thing. 
Maybe in the end it actually works out to everybody's benefit. Maybe we get a stronger WrestleMania card because of it. But this affects a lot of different people. Not just himself. And not just Triple H. You know, and maybe he's right. Maybe they could do better than Punk vs. Triple H. Maybe he figured he was losing the match. That'd be pretty stupid if, if he was going to lose, but who knows? It could be any of those things. But it's disrespectful to walk out an hour or a couple of hours before the show. Now, some people are still skeptical. They think it has to be a work. It's not a work. Not everything is a work. Some people still insist that Montreal was this elaborate work. Probably the same people who claim to see Bigfoot or little green Martians stealing socks off people's feet. Let's see how many of you get that reference. Elvis and Tupac are not off somewhere making a duet. Okay, WWE went ahead, they pulled Punk from all of the Access signings WrestleMania weekend, and they replaced him with Ric Flair. They're not going to piss off people who already paid to see Punk, and possibly, not even possibly, they're, they're offering to refund people's money. People are getting refunds issued because when they paid for their tickets a week ago, or whenever Access tickets went on sale, they were expecting... And they paid good money because I think a basic access ticket is like $40 or $45. Those VIP signing tickets are a lot more. They may be more than double. So there are people that paid really good money to specifically see CM Punk, take a picture with him, get his autograph. And now WWE has to refund people's money. I mean, what, it's part of some elaborate angle? If they paid that much attention to detail, I'd have nothing to talk about anymore. (laughs) It'd be great. But they don't. And so if Punk did bail on them and and did so only a little while before the show last Monday, that's not cool. You've got to honor your commitments. Chris Jericho wasn't happy with his position in WCW. He decided he was leaving. He was going to WWE. He still had a few months left on his contract. He knew he was going to get jobbed out by Bischoff on his way out. Should he have just said, oh, you know, in March and April, screw you, I'm going home? I'm sure WCW would have claimed breach of contract and it would have turned into a whole big legal mess. But no, he he gutted it out until the end of his deal and he made the jump. When Brock Lesnar decided, I hate travel, I hate people, I'm beat up, I don't want to do this anymore. Did he hop on the next flight back to Minnesota? No. He finished his contract out, he did the job to Goldberg at WrestleMania. I'm sure he didn't like it, but he did it. He made the commitment. And he was factored into some big plans they had for WrestleMania. He didn't just go home. I'm sure if they wanted to, they could take Punk to court for breach of contract. You know, they're not going to do that. Not if they have any uh, hope of getting him back at some point. I don't think they want to burn that bridge. You know, I mean, look, he could very well come back before WrestleMania. I'm sure they're going to try. I don't know if Punk would want to listen, but of of course they're going to try to get him back as soon as possible. I'm sure they would love to have him back by the time Raw comes to Chicago on March 3rd. Maybe he'll come to his senses. They just had an NXT taping on Thursday with fans hijacking all the shows that night with chants of CM Punk. Security confiscated a whole bunch of Punk signs. It's going to be very interesting to see on Raw this week and in the weeks to come what the reaction is like from the crowds at the arenas. You know, maybe those Daniel Bryan chants start to get drowned out by chants of CM Punk. I'm not too worried about Brian. He's, believe me, people will still cheer their heads off for the guy. He'll be fine. If he, if he, Look, if Punk's not back with them by that Raw on March 3rd, you know, that's going to be a fun night, okay? <laughs> We're going to have a hijacking that like we've never seen before. And I can almost have sympathy with WWE in that case. I have no sympathy for them when it comes to Brian. They get what they deserve. But when it comes to Punk, believe me, they didn't want him to leave. This was his decision. So I think in that case... It might be fun for us to watch on TV, and it might be fun for the fans in the building that night, but I would have a a little bit of sympathy for WWE, because this was not... You could say that they they helped contribute to the situation, maybe they helped even cause it, but the guy walked out. Nobody forced him to do that. That was his decision. If the people there are pissed off that they expected Punk when they bought their Raw tickets and Punk's not there, blame Punk. Don't blame Vince McMahon. And uh, the belief now is that Daniel Bryan will be slotted in most likely against Triple H, taking Punk's place at WrestleMania, which would mean the rumored match with Sheamus is off, thankfully. I think that's an improvement from what they had planned for him before. But if you're Sheamus, this goes back to what I said before about walking out and how that affects other people, you're probably not too happy about that. I still think they're making a mistake if they don't put the belt on Bryan at WrestleMania. 
you know, Extreme Rules is in Seattle, so I guess you could do it there. After that giant reaction he got last month on Raw, I'm sure he'll get a hero's welcome. But to, to delay this thing even more, I, I don't know. You know, maybe maybe the chamber, maybe the elimination chamber is the place to do it. We already know Brian is in the match. So even though there's five other guys, Brian is getting his title shot at the pay-per-view later this month. Maybe have it come down to Brian and Orton, or even Brian and Cena. I'm sure the place would, would come unglued. You don't want it to be like the chamber match from SummerSlam, where Goldberg was super over in that match. That was the night to put the world title on him. They didn't do it. And then when he finally won it a month later, it just wasn't the same. But for WrestleMania, a match with Triple H at least makes sense for the story they started last summer. And it's a better match than Sheamus in that you know there ain't no Triple H match that's going to be opening the show at WrestleMania. You, you, you at least know that much, okay? Whereas before, if it was going to be Brian and Sheamus, I absolutely would have seen or would have expected to see them open the show. And that's just not the position you want to put a guy like Brian in. Forget whether you think he deserves to open the show or end the show or whatever. Can you imagine if they put Daniel Bryan in the opening match of WrestleMania? How that crowd would just crap all over the rest of the card except maybe Undertaker's match because I think they have enough respect for him not to do that. So maybe they should. If it's going to be Brian and Triple H, they've been building this up since the summer, maybe they should put that match on last at WrestleMania. I'm not a fan of, of relegating your world title to second or third rate status, but I guarantee you, if they put Batista and Randy Orton on in the main event, it's going to be a disaster. It's just going to be a disaster. And this is your WrestleMania 30 main event, right? This is one of those landmark WrestleMania shows. I mean, they'll call it the 30th anniversary. It isn't technically. And... You're going to put Batista versus Randy Orton in that spot with the way the fans have been reacting to these guys. And you have a lot of international people coming in for WrestleMania. So I don't buy for a sec, oh, well, you know, you don't know how the crowd's going to be that night. They might behave themselves. I I don't see that happening. I've been to two WrestleManias now. This will be my third. And it's a relatively new phenomenon. Like I said at the beginning of the podcast, we're, we're in the middle of this very weird period here where the fans seem to be revolting. And you can say when you're at a show, people are like sheep. If one person starts a chant and ten people pick it up and another ten people pick it up and soon soon the entire building will be doing it because they just follow the leader, okay, well, that's fine for one or two shows or maybe a, a crowd the night after WrestleMania who just wants to have fun and you get a bunch of people chanting silly stuff and it just kind of catches on. We're seeing this now week after week. After week, after week, you know, the story of the Royal Rumble this year is going to have nothing to do with anything that really happened on the show and have everything to do with what didn't happen and how the crowd completely hijacked it. That's the story of the Royal Rumble this year. Do they really want that to be the story of WrestleMania? They have to have enough foresight to see, okay, Randy Orton's not over. Batista has his fans, and, and there will be weeks where he gets more cheers in certain cities than others. But there is this underlying feeling of resentment by a certain portion of the audience that this guy was away for four years, he's making movies, he came back, and and a lot of those people may not even know that he's back full-time. They may look at Batista and and think that he's got the same kind of deal that Rock has and that Brock has. And who is this guy to come in? And we're not going to see him at house shows, and we're not going to see him on TV every week, even though Batista is doing house shows. And Batista probably will be on TV every week. But there's this underlying feeling of resentment, and you take those two things, a guy who's not over and a guy who is, but you have a segment of the audience that really just doesn't like him for whatever reason. I mean, I don't think they want to have a main event that kind of mimics Goldberg and Brock in the Garden at WrestleMania 20. That match was a spectacle. It's the only word I could come up with for it. And actually, I can that, that match wasn't any good at all. I mean, you, you envision a match between two big titans like Brock Lesnar and and, uh, and Bill Goldberg. I went back and watched that match again recently. The first, like, ten minutes of the match is just all stalling. It, it The match just, it never clicked, it never worked. You could see both guys were rattled by the crowd reaction. And Batista comes off to me as the kind of guy who I don't think Batista or Orton are guys that you want to put out there. And if the crowd turns on them, I don't trust that they're going to react in a very positive way. Orton's a bit of a hothead. Uh, Batista seemed to be bothered by the whole thing. I know when the Rumble went off the air, he flipped off some some guy, you know, some fan in the audience. Although we don't know what the guy said or did to him. 
Uh, I, I just this is a disaster waiting to happen if they keep that match as is and they put that on in the main event of WrestleMania. It's going to get ugly unless you turn it into a three way match and you put Brian in there, which is another idea that I've seen floated around that WWE apparently is considering making it a three way match with Orton, Batista, and Brian. And God knows I hate multi man matches as the WrestleMania main event. I, I think it should just be one on one, whatever the match is. But that's the only way you could save that match from total destruction. 